So I will be talking today about reforming usefulness, ethics and aesthetics of Swinland culture. I use the word Swinland advisedly, by the way. <laughs> Robert Frost once described, surprise, of finding a perfect stack of firewood while walking through a lonesome stretch of forest. His narrator says, quote, I thought that only someone who lived in turning to fresh tasks could so forget his handiwork on which he spent himself, the labor of his acts, and leave it there far from a useful fireplace to warm the frozen swamp as best it could. Now, I enjoy that poem on its own merits. I confess, however, an additional surprise in that it inspired me to look again at Swiss Reformation. <laughs> Frost's scene does bear some hints of Reformed tradition, especially, of course, of Calvinism in its Puritan mode. Such a New England may, if ever a history can, sustain some of Max Weber's thesis concerning a Protestant work ethic. Weber infamously argued that a Calvinist doctrine of divine predestination created conditions of psychological distress, isolation, insecurity, which in turn compelled, compelled productive activism within an ultimately, in fact, secularized world inimical to aesthetics and increasingly devoid of an outmoded, quote, superstition. Of course, the irony in Frost's poem is that the compulsion to be, quote, useful has become the very tick of utility. The wanderer, the wanderer who had cut and stacked a perfectly useless cord of firewood was in fact compelled to spin himself being useful. This critique of Puritanism and Frost and Weber seem to overlap on the point retains a measure of validity, even so it shall we say it sparks, in me some reservation regarding the intersection of useful action, useful action and beauty, or the perception of beauty in Swiss Reform origins of Reform tradition. A distinctly Zwinglian study of the nexus of ethics and aesthetics is useful indeed to a truer picture of Reform legacy. So here we go. <clears throat> Swiss Reformers' convictions about almost everything involve profound connections with usefulness. Reasons for such an emphasis had arisen exuberantly in the literary movement of humanism. One need look only to Moore's Utopia for ample evidence of that. Distinctly evangelical commitment to usefulness, furthermore, meant deleting what were now perceived to be, in fact, useless additives to devotion, notably in religious imagery. Swingley and many other early reformers came to consider traditional material devotional aids as part of an elaborate system that had encumbered piety with self-serving distractions. I think Lee Palmer Wando has described it in the early modern Zurich context quite well. She discusses the worry lest the civic obligation to charity be handicapped or crippled in this case by a practice of reserving resources such as oil, wood, even wealth to the liturgical elements and the images. And this was a precondition that formed a receptive audience for Zurich reformers preaching against the ravenous idols. Iconoclasm in such a light was not a boorish resentment of material splendor, so much of the, oh, nor was it an instance of demythologizing or secularizing. Charity, in this case, was a long-standing theological virtue that applied to civic responsibility. In an effort to maintain public order amidst this transition, and here we get to something really cool, the Zurich Council, on the 8th of June, 1524, articulated a distinct policy for a special class of images, the crucifix. The magistracy defined a crucifix, in this case, as a representation of Christ's humanity and not as a representation of divinity. In other words, people should Stop vandalizing them. The crucifix in public squares, in the byways, this is no longer a pretension of divinity, said the magistrates. 
The reality of God and the spiritual presence in the material world here and now was not in question, but public order required new reckonings with the relatedness of God and the world. That initial distinction about crucifix is collapsed as early as one week later. On the 15th of June, 1524, that same council made a blanket mandate for the removal of all images, with no exemptions for the redefined crucifix. Ostensibly now for the worship of God alone, resources ought rather to be directed to poor humans who themselves, who themselves bear the image of God. The crucifix is not finally problematic because it is a material representation of the invisible God. It is problematic because it is superfluous. The community already contains the devotional equivalent of crucifixes and its living and indeed suffering people. Presuming to go beyond that reality would violate charity and it would corrupt the elegance of grace in an almost optimistic way. The very process of removing now illicit imagery was carefully scripted to proceed in accord with decorum. And here was a conspicuous juncture of appropriate conduct with the beauty of form and measure. Concerns for useful charity necessarily and positively included considerations of elegance versus superfluity, and of measured discipline versus tumult and excess. The reformational agenda was not how to separate divine and human, or spirit and matter, but rather how to properly reimagine the useful image, the useful and indeed beautiful image. Zwingli reminded people that God forbade construction of idols because such images were useless, de useless decoys of the real image of God already present in the community. Any idol, as such, exhibits immoral appetite for the superfluous, the immoderate, the inessential or unbasically. Conspicuous emphasis on reformed usefulness also appears in the fact that what had been called the Mass came, of course, to be called what? Dienst. Service. Reformers similarly replaced the notion of sacramental priesthood with a ministerial concept of service in the church. Kirchendienst. There was strong semantic relation between words incorporating Dienst Dienstlich and Nützlich in many discussions. These words stood out in even sharper profile against their foils, notably the useless liturgies and images and their association with the calculus with merit, which also uses that crucial word dienst, fair dienst. Note here again that, uh, that pairing, divine, self, divine service versus the self-interested calculus of merit. Zwingli and Reform sought to liberate Christian life from any taint of spiritual self-service, such as they understood to be embedded in the system of merit, Fidians, dispensed through sacramental penitence, or Use. In Reformation Zurich, the language of punitive compensation continued. It did continue. One could still speak of Use, right? But only in a magisterial sense. There was Busa for a, a civil offense. The civil government constituted the realm of external human righteousness, and church leadership, by contrast, entirely lacked coercive authority, lest it ceased to be a servant in its proper order. In its England context, pastors were construed as scripture-bound spokespersons of inner divine righteousness. Now we have to turn a little bit to this inner-outer distinction. <clears throat> the inner outer distinction in Zwingli language does not imply incipient secularization. No state in that magisterial state that can apply Abusa. Uh, no state should necessarily be the enemy of the church, and political rule may even attain the designation of being truly, quote, Christian, where it implements a biblical pattern in legislating right and wrong proper behavior. Zwingli remained quite clear, however, that coercive authority is not itself divine righteousness. It is not that the people of the state are detached from contact with divine righteousness in their daily existence, but rather that the specifically coercive aspect cannot delimit spirit. That which is coercive it is calculable. Hence the connection between Ferdinand and Busa. You will be 
find so much money for such and such an offense. Church ministry is a testimony of self-transcending service that only works in an unencumbered freedom to give. Ecclesiastical service leadership would void its own authenticity if it were to presume to make claims on conscience. In doing such, it would become nearly another version of the papal clergy or monastic orders that seemingly everywhere characterized as hypocrisy, external hypocrisy, leaves in their eyes. Church ministry may not bind free consciences, but does necessarily encompass material considerations such as the valid basis in scriptural exegesis and service among especially the poor who bear the true image of God, Christ. Zwingli's pedagogical exhortations are also consistent with this agenda. He instructed students not to blurt out words. Nice instruction. Not to blurt out words, but rather to keep silence while learning from a wise elder. In a similar vein, bodily gestures must be disciplined to comport with right speech. Only let everything, quote, serve truth rather than ostentation. The restraint, the restraint of silence and the austerity of public space, shorn, shorn of liturgical imagery, should positively underscore the relational charitable matrix. Again, <clears throat> I'm in the process here of aiming at that distinctly performed, distinctly singly an intersection of ethics, right conduct, and aesthetics, or calculus of what is beautiful. The meaning of what constitutes proper behavior and criteria. If there is truth to the Veda thesis that reform aesthetics developed in consequence to a theological principle of predestination, it is highly relevant to note that a seemingly anesthetic blended incarnational Christocentrism with a consistently robust interest in the doctrine of not so much predestination but providence. Seemingly asserted that God is the supreme good, encompassing all other goods in a providential matrix of creation. It's further relevant to note etymological implications for sight and thus visual beauty in this word providence, right? Pro videre. Right alongside ethical implications of sharing and giving in that same word, providence. Singley typically spoke of righteousness together as all together, righteousness all together as the greatest quote beauty, especially in von der Bichel and Providence in a singly mode, or for that matter, <coughs> also in a late medieval scholastic mode, formed a crucial starting point of the positive assessment of the material realm of human experience. Like many other aspects of Zurich Reformation, the concept of providence also is prominent in pedagogical literature. According to Zwingli, any young person's proper worldview must involve an observation of the transience of all things vis-a-vis -vis the uniquely abiding God. Transience of the material world is itself purposeful usefulness. The, the disciplined perspective develops a healthy suspicion of idolatry. It serves to transcend selfishness while highlighting the soul dependability of God. This is entirely consistent with the sort of trust, by the way, in divine will, even in and through suffering, that's mainly already articulated in his 1519 debates in, in the past. Again, the material world, with its limitations <coughs> of time and space, constitutes the spiritually important, even aesthetic, qualities of measure, seemliness, appropriateness, and then discipline and restraint. Swingley developed his doctrine of providence in a Christological mode, surely. The gospel positively illumined God's engagement with the material world from the two sparrows for a penny, on up through all events culminating in the crucifixion and resurrection, the saving effect of Christ is not to deliver people from their materiality or to inspire indifference vis-a-vis -vis the world, but rather to inspire proper action in relationship where the self is not the center of meaning. I'm going to skip a lengthy quotation at this point for time. All material circumstances are the setting for right behavior that relies on a providential scheme of hope and optimism in the hereafter. 
than ever. Reformational texts from Singley and from the Zurich Magistracy alike highlight the intersection of qualities of beauty with ethical consideration. Together, and often practically synonymous with the term useful or nützli, are words such as mas, zinglich, gemäß, zünftiglich, bescheidenlich, hübsch, lieblich, süß, zierlich, and of course, schön, beautiful. Opposite terms serve to put in even greater relief these values. Note, for example, the following web of related words. Uh, I'll just use the English here. Uselessness, self-service, unseemly, inappropriate, immoderate, excessive, superfluous, outrageous, disorderly, and vain, or in fact, useless, all connected. The ethical lifestyle is visible in a kind of elegance of discipline over self because God is the providential the whole system of thought is utterly Christological and incarnational with reference to the self-giving God in Christ. If the aesthetic of Christendom had previously focused on the functionality of liturgical implements and images, Singley redirected the meeting point of spirit and matter to the everyday community, the community, the relational community, acting in faith. We must take special care when assessing Singley's use of the term superstition. <clears throat> Recent scholarship has already helpfully brought attention to the widespread 16th century Protestant beliefs in things like witches, spirits, angels, demons, ghosts. Even the local scholar to the Bethany also has uh, observed that Swingley and Bullinger himself did not consider supernatural appearances to be, quote, superstitious because of an outright unreality of those spiritual forces in the world, but rather because they challenge proper action in the community. Reformed aversion to certain elements of traditional piety did not arise out of an assumption that spiritual practice with materiality per se is deceptive. Rather, it had to do with a shifting conviction, conviction as to what is the appropriate image of God. Furthermore, it is helpful to recall that the very term superstition functioned commonly as a humanist's catch-all for religious impropriety. Just as humans themselves retrofitted the word from their own uh, uh, readings of classical Latin. I mention that especially because it's easy to assume the word superstition applies to a general um, either materialist or proto-materialist approach to the world, such as one might read in, say, Voltaire. This is not how they're using superstition. Having purged piety of purgatory, Having perched piety of purgatory with all its prospect for making up lost time in an eventual afterlife, Swingley and Reform emphasize the act of material life and spiritual reality as experienced right now. <clears throat> Sometimes expressing this confluence involves modes of paradox or irony, also not atypical features of humanism. Swingley described God as an unattainable, quote, measure of beauty, who was nevertheless perfectly conveyed to you and now because of his agency that tr transcends selfish action. The sinful condition of all humanity since Adam consists of measureless, selfish appetite. I do this. Okay. Was ist nun mein rein Herz oder welches ist rein? Kein Zug werden, dann welches Haut an ihm, dass es nicht eigennützig sei, selbstständig, oder dass es allen Haut unter Maske sei. God gave a custodian of external law, which in itself cannot say, but which moderates humanity's own unrighteous urge toward self or self-destruction. Singly described heaven not as an eventual payback for personal merit, but as a state of life together in a household which in some respects already experience, experiences God in community, in its unity, all of whose members bear a family likeness with God. <clears throat> The incarnational relation of material life to spiritual transcendence appears perhaps nowhere more clearly for Zingli than in his approach to the Bible. Any approach to biblical text that is not dynamic, collegial, sharing, violates the Zinglian principle of Christological incarnation as much as devotional statuary. 
This is clear in Zwingli's description of the practicalities of translating as an effective communication of biblical sense rather than an exercise of literalism. Uh, and I think this ties in nicely with Aurelio's exposition. The interpreter may not rely on himself, his own abilities, his own literal access to the text. It must be collegial. Biblical interpretation and application must follow criteria of effect moderation and relational discipline in ways that open the self to service, among others. Zwingli and criteria, criteria of biblical beauty include features such as restraint rather than superfluity, discipline rather than excess, and shared usefulness rather than a selfish calculus of that which is proprietary. Moving to the home stretch now. <clears throat> Collegial biblical interpretation was the prophetic hallmark of the same reform. Biblical interpretation required prophetic courage to, re to rebuke injustice, which, let it be recalled, is the explicit opposite of the, quote, beauty of divine justice. Injustice, justice, disfigurement, beauty. In this vein, Zwingli even criticized some who had inspired his own appreciation for the values of usefulness, elegance, moderation, and appropriateness. He upbraided scholars who preferred urbane respectability and their own reputation for learnedness. Such people, argued Zwingli, curry favor from patrons rather than speaking prophetically, thereby ruining the very pattern of relational discipline in community. Um, seems to me interesting that Erasmus in that very same year, 1529, will say pretty much the, the same thing about the pseudo-evangelicals. And, and it seems that Zwingli, for his part, has someone like Erasmus in his own mind. The hypocrite, says Zwingli, commits the worst sort of appetite and greed by having sold himself in a fatal attempt to acquire some benefit for himself. Just as many other features of traditional devotion now appear to be an expression of excessive appetite for merit. Excessive appetite. Elsewhere, it seemingly observed that people undermine their very Christianity in speaking much about God without commensurate discipline. Authentic prophecy fails among those who value mere appearances or who seek their own pleasure. The material world is urgently important for devotion because it is a form of justice and a context for transcending selfish appetite. Usefulness, proper action, and beauty in seemingly in thought always work with incarnational logic. Jesus is the perpetual meeting point of God and humanity, and the union necessarily effects salvation by means of its servant usefulness. By contrast, hellish suffering the opposite of heavenly fellowship with the righteous God emerges from a lifestyle opposed to usefulness. That is, from a lifestyle that can be described indeed as excessive, immoderate, superfluous, unseemly, hypocritical, and self-seeking. Zwingli avoids characterizing damnation as an expression of absolute divine tyranny. Rather, he says, human beings who seek their own gain generate their own disfiguring harm. When I read that, it uh, struck me as eerily similar to any number of late medieval painting hellscapes where persons are suffering a, a sort of torment directly calculated in accordance with their own appetites. <clears throat> Even the humanist interest in returning to the sources must remain on guard against examples of arrogance, violence, and uh, useless, vain wisdom even though the remedy example of that is still Ulysses tied to the mast. So, the soteriological lifestyle participates in God's self-giving in union with humanity as community. And usefulness is an aesthetic, it is an aesthetic, <coughs> of elegant restraint and of any excess of appetite of self toward others. God is useful in this incarnational mode, and yet paradoxically, usefulness rules out, rules out the utilitarian calculus. Zwinglian Reformation rightly brings to mind efforts to purge piety from what appears, from what its partisans perceived to be, 
a pervasive tendency to swap out self-serving things for genuine biblical Christianity. The Zwinglian agenda did not express its notable horror of idols in terms of incipient secularity or because of any theologically motivated worry that criteria of beauty conflicted with hope of salvation. Zwingli and his colleagues reimagined usefulness as an intersection of ethical action and formal beauty and an overall matrix of providence and Christocentrism. As such, Zwingli and reform applied a robust set of largely humanist aesthetic criteria of moderation, elegance, decorum, appropriateness, in contrast to excess, immoderation, tumult, hypocrisy, and superfluity. In all of this, <clears throat> the human condition was valued in its very materiality as a context for experiencing the beauty of righteousness through self-giving usefulness. The individual achieves paradoxical and therefore never, never utilitarian identity in offering self within the relational context of God and the world. The faithful person, the faithful person as such, cannot be conceived without the beauty of righteousness in the face of others. Thank you very much.